What are the end times? Now, as far as people's positions on which one of these definite terms are accurate or not, these can be discussed reasonably and on separate issues and discussions. I'd be more than happy to clarify my positions as well as to allow and give platform for my fellow believers to clarify theirs. So already off the bat, I'm saying that this is not a non-negotiable term. But when it comes to the end times, it is definitely and ironically enough a good revealer, revelation reference anybody, of someone's handling of scripture and what ultimately are their primary authorities. Now, when someone says the end times, just in simple terms, what they generally are referring to, and we can be even more broad about this and make a certain reference, it is the time when things end. But perhaps being a bit more specific than that, it is a reference to what people call the rapture, the tribulation, and the millennium. Now, there are those who disagree on the timing, the content, and the fine details of these certain things. But as far as whether or not they are mentioned in scripture, they wouldn't be dismissed. As far as their most pragmatic definition is concerned, what the literal definition of the end times are, it would be the culmination and conclusion of God's current work in this world, where all things are made new, and ultimately we are restored to an everlasting and eternal relationship with Him. Now, of course, there are those who are living in the end times now and today. There are those who will live in the last days in the future. And there are also those who won't see either will be with Jesus while all these things will simply pass them by. They'll be with the Lord, not in this world. So with those things to remember, it will be an event that takes place in this world. It will be a time period that will take place in time. And, of course, it involves certain things that we want to define, and here's the most important thing to understand about the last days, is that we define them scripturally. So what I'm going to do is put forward the positions that are most broadly accepted, and, of course, popular positions don't necessarily make them true, but we're going to authenticate all of these claims with a minimum of two, sometimes three. In fact, I'll make the effort to provide three different sources in scripture and in full context in order to establish any of them. But I'm not going to read them. I want you to look these up on your own time and allow the passages to form your conclusions. We're not looking to films. We're not looking to popular books or media. We're looking to scripture. So I guess one popular book or collection of books, but here's the point that's being made. For those that would say, oh, there is no rapture, well, we have to clarify. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by rapture? If it appears in Scripture, would you care? If I could show you and explain within a reasonable doubt that this is, in fact, something that Scripture talks about, we can talk about the timing or the significance, the mode in which this will take place in a later time. But if they proactively deny it, well, then their issue isn't with me or with the concept of the rapture. It's with Scripture. They don't want this position to be real. And that's another issue entirely. It's not concerning the end times. It's concerning the authority of Scripture, which is a vital issue for Christians. So, what are the end times usually constituting the time that things end, generally referring to the rapture, the tribulation, and the millennium to follow, ultimately leading into the new creation, most detailed in the book of Revelation, but throughout the Old Testament as well. Now, there are terms that we need to remember, and I'll be listing seven, and as stated, we will be giving scripture references as well into where and why we come to these conclusions. The first is, of course, the one that 90% of most Christians can agree is a real thing, the tribulation, which is also referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel, and so forth. Where do we find out about this event? Well, it's referred to as Jacob's trouble during Jeremiah, or in Jeremiah, chapter 30, verses 5 through 7, wherein the context is referenced in definitely a prophetic setting, not only facing down the shadow of the Babylonian exile, but in reference to the last days. And it uh, goes on to give some pretty graphic descriptions of some guys who, uh, well, are grabbing a very vital and sensitive portion of their anatomy. So it's not a good day at all. 
It's also detailed for us in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, where it notes not only that it will involve the nation of Israel, but also previously as well, we're given the date setting for this to be figured out in Daniel chapter 9 as well. What will happen? Well, the word tribulation or trouble usually refers to bad things happening, and the details and events within are given to us in what I believe is chronological order in Revelation chapters 6 through 18, all in detail. What won't happen? Whatever isn't mentioned in the text. We stick to what we're told, not what our culture wants to think it means. So note that. The second major topic that's discussed whenever the end times are brought up is the rapture of the church. Where do we find out about this event? Well, in three primary places, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54, the context of the statement follows from a passage that begins, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, on the resurrection of Jesus, builds up and on the topic of the resurrection and why it is vital for there to be one, and then ultimately concludes with a clarification that even though we well, most of us will all physically die. There will come a time where we won't die, but we will, we will excuse me, still be transitioned to heaven the same way. This method or mode of transportation is uh, actually where we get the word rapture from in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, where the phrase caught up is used to describe not only what Paul was also clarifying in 1 Corinthians 15, it's the same context and setting, discussing the resurrection, though, though uh, concerning those who have written to me about those who have fallen asleep, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And you can go into what he meant to be understood as sleep. You can note references that when Jesus is described as falling asleep, other passages clarify he was died. Uh, when Jesus observed dead bodies, he also used this euphemism culturally. It was referring to physical bodily death, but not spiritual death. Spiritual death is hell. So <laughs> with that said, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17 says that we will be caught up together with them with the in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall also always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, we w can clarify at another time the timing of the rapture, perhaps. I've made videos on it, but I'd be happy to discuss it further as to the positions and scriptural citation as to why I take those beliefs. But another straightforward example of this in action would be Revelation 4 and verse 1, where John, in reference to the church, is told by a voice in heaven, come up here, and I will tell you the things which must take place after this. And it says immediately he was caught up to the third heaven, and he saw God in his glory, making plenty of references to Ezekiel and Isaiah to describe what he and they also saw. Now, it's important to note as well, this isn't a proof text for the rapture per se, but it is an important application because as John is caught up to be with the Lord in heaven, the tribulation then follows two chapters later as the Lamb takes the scroll and begins to loose the seals. And the seals are references to the judgments that will take place there. We can verify that from the Old Testament given how they are also applied in Zechariah. But all that being said... The third, and definitely universally agreed upon by Christians, event that will take place in the end times is the second coming of Christ. Note, not the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ, where the fulfilled prophecy of Zechariah, where he will set foot on the Mount of Olives, the valley will split into what will then be called the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and a new spring of water will flow from the Dead Sea and thus produce a new life-giving valley where Israel will then be able to reign with Jesus finally as its king. The passages where we find out about the second coming of Christ, uh, obviously it is referenced in Revelation 16, 16 through 19. It is detailed for us in Revelation 19, 11 through the end. And also noted in 1 Thessalonians 4, or excuse me, uh, Matthew 24, uh, verses 29 through 31. And it also clarifies the brightness of his coming and the context of the last days, the destruction of the Antichrist armies, and the reference that would be later clarified in Revelation 19 in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. So Revelation 16, 16 through 19, Revelation 19, 11 to the end of the chapter, and Matthew 24, 29 through 31, also as a second note, passing reference, but still one, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. What will happen? 
Jesus will physically return to this world the way the disciples expected him to the first time. What won't happen? Whatever isn't mentioned in the text. We stick to what we're told, not what culture tells us it means. Fourth is the Antichrist. Where do we find out about this individual or this event? Uh, his the term Antichrist, rather, comes up in 1 John for the first time. 1 John 4, 3 is an example. He's also referred to by other names like the man of sin, the son of perdition, the wicked king of the north, the Assyrian, so on and so forth. But uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4, leading up to the second coming of Christ, he will be the one that will be destroyed by Jesus with the brightness of his coming, but he is referenced there. And of course, Daniel 9, 27, where the famous abomination that causes desolation, his act that was ultimately f uh, foreshadowed and uh, early fulfillment by Antiochus Epiphanes later on in Daniel's chapters 10 through 11. What will happen? A man will come to this world and claim to be the Christ. He will be lying. And after three and a half years, he will demand that anyone who doesn't worship him as God must be killed. What won't happen? Whatever isn't mentioned in the text. We stick to what we're told, not what culture tells us it means. The fifth, and this again is generally agreed upon by Christians to be a literal historical event, or prophetic event, but note it will be in history, is the Battle of Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo, the Mountains of Megiddo. Where do we find out about this event? Uh, it's most directly referenced in Revelation 16, 16, and 19, 19. You can go on through 21, but I liked the line up of the numbers there. What will happen? The world's armies fighting each other will join the Antichrist and try to take on Jesus. They will fail. <laughs> what won't happen? Whatever isn't mentioned in the text. We stick to what we're told, not what culture thinks it means. And note, I'm saying this over and over again because I'm trying to keep this as plain and as simple, as uncontroversial as possible. If you disagree with whether or not these things are in the Bible or aren't, that's fine. I just want you to know that there are reasons why I take certain positions, and I want to make sure you're applying the same standards as well. So note that. Sixth is the thousand-year reign of Christ. It has become popular recently to dismiss this, but it has been a position that has been taught, held, understood, and believed throughout Christian history, going all the way back to the early church fathers and what those who hold the proponent believe by the apostles as well. But where do we find out about this event? Most directly in Revelation 20, 1 through 10, but we also get reference to it in Isaiah chapter 11, the whole chapter is referring to Jesus' reign and as well throughout the books of Isaiah and Ezekiel. But why is it necessary? Now, understand this. The most direct reference in Revelation 20 Verses 1 through 10 notes that in this world, but before the new creation, the new creation in Revelation 21, after the old heaven and the old earth have passed away, the earth is still here in Revelation 20. Because in 21, old heaven and old earth pass away. The end of Revelation 20, the old heaven and the old earth pass away. At the beginning of Revelation 20, it hasn't. Note the understanding. But also note this as well. God has made promises to Israel in this world and on these borders and on this planet before it has passed away that he has yet to fulfill. And if he fails to keep his promises, then he's not to be trusted. But because I believe he can be, I trust him to fulfill these promises as they are spoken. And this is important to note because we refer to it as the thousand-year reign of Christ because it says Jesus will rule this world from Jerusalem, detailed in later passages, or earlier passages rather, in Jerusalem for a thousand years. What won't happen? Whatever isn't mentioned in the text. Just taking this plainly. What We stick to what we're told, not what our culture tells us it means. And then finally, seventh, the new creation. Every Christian, hopefully, believes this. Where do we find out about this event? Revelation 21, 1 through 8. What will happen? God will allow the previous universe and earth to dissipate, and he will create everything new. What won't happen? Whatever isn't mentioned in the text. We stick to what we're told, not what culture thinks it means. And also note, uh, mentioned two passages, Second Peter chapter 3 also mentions the old heaven and the old earth uh, passing away with a great noise and a fervent heat. 
So that would be another proof text. Noting a minimum of two. We'll hold me to that standard. But when people mean the end times, that's generally what they're referring to. And note these issues are definitely secondary details, but the secondary details are something we should come to conclusions on based on scripture. You're allowed to come to different conclusions than me, and then history can prove us right or wrong. But the emphasis needs to be, if you dismiss these things not because they're mentioned in Scripture, or not, but because you don't like them. You've seen them abused. You've seen people uh, have these false views about them before in the past. Look, people had false views about who Jesus was in the past. It didn't mean he wasn't going to come. Second, if people are going to mishandle Scripture, that's on them. It doesn't mean it should give us an impression or a emotional bias against certain topics in scripture. And then lastly, we shouldn't dismiss certain biblical themes because they've made less than ideal movies about it. We need to make sure that our understanding of scripture is informed and defined from scripture. But if on the other hand, you think that these are all secondary details and just prefer to pass them by, I won't hold you to that. But we need to understand as well that they're in scripture for a reason, and I would rather have more of God's word than less. So that is how we define the end times. If you have sincere questions or perhaps even disagree with me and want to have a productive dialogue, you can feel free to look up the videos in which I have provided links to our Discord, or uh, perhaps you can just ask in the comments. I'll send it to you there as well. And perhaps we can set up a conversation or even a debate as to whether or not these things are biblically valid. Feel free to let me know, and I'll be happy to provide my reasons. But note this as well, you are allowed to have different ones. You're allowed to have contrary ones. Just make sure whatever you believe within Scripture is informed, defined, and supported in context from Scripture. Not emotions, not anything else. So, I look forward to talking to you all next time, and we will be discussing what is textual criticism, which will be a very important topic for us to understand in reference to the Old Testament. And until then, I look forward to seeing you all next time.